What does it mean to be reclaimed? Merriam-Webster's definition is to rescue from an undesirable state. Now I'm sure many of us have looked within ourselves and found things that we saw as undesirable. We as humans make mistakes all the time, and for whatever reason, we make choices that hurt not only ourselves, but also those around us. Sometimes those choices we make boil past the threshold of what we as a society have agreed is too far. Nowadays, most societies use prisons to manage those that break the rules that we have come to agree on. And why are we in any way drawn to these places? Well, perhaps it's the way it's been depicted on TV. Although we have prisons scattered all over the world, some have become more notorious than others. From Guantanamo Bay to Robben Island, the latter of which held the famous Nelson Mandela. But perhaps the most famous of all is the one and only Alcatraz, known for the many stories of escaped attempts and holding prisoners like Al Capone and Robert Stroud. However, this is not a video about these prisons. This is a video about a prison much closer to home for those that live in Utah. One that many would never even know existed if they weren't alive when it was being used. If you live in Utah, and more specifically if you live in Salt Lake City, then you have more than likely been to Sugar House Park. Well, it wasn't always a park. In Utah, when the Mormon pioneers arrived in 1847, they didn't bring a prison with them. Crime was actually punished by local leaders. Restitution of crimes were seen as more of a spiritual issue. This manner of dealing with crime just could not last forever. In October of 1853, Brigham Young, who was the second leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, selected the 10-acre government-owned site, then known as the Big Field Survey. A location that at the time was far enough away from the people that lived in Salt Lake City. Utah was not a state at the time, so the penitentiary would be owned by the federal government. The construction was completed in 1854, and in 1855 the prison was open. A newspaper at the time described the prison as 16 cozy cells dug into the ground with iron bars on top. We can actually thank the wardens for a lot of the kept history we have today, as part of their job was to keep a detailed record of the happenings inside the prison. Pretty early on, the penitentiary would be seen as inadequate. It needed improvements. Now, interestingly, for any of you who watched my video on John Baptiste, you know that the grave robber was exiled to Fremont Island in the Great Salt Lake. Well, that wasn't the only time Fremont Island was thought of as a great place to put a jail cell. In 1867, the Utah Territorial Legislature believed that the prison was becoming inadequate and had its eyes on moving the prison to Fremont Island far from people. This vision was never seen through. Instead, improvements were made to keep up with the demand at the original site. But let's be honest, how cool would it be to have an island prison. The prison was struggling with insufficient funds, so from 1864 to 1871, they didn't even have a night guard. Now this resulted in a lot of prison escapes. From 1855 to 1878, it was believed that 47 of the 240 convicts escaped and that 12 were killed in the attempted escapes. So just think, for every 20 prisoners, about one of them would escape. Unfortunately for some, their life of freedom wouldn't last long and they would be recaptured. I'm free! I'm free! Dang it! In 1877, the prison would see a much needed renovation. 200 cells were added in this renovation. Also added were bathrooms, a kitchen, a bakery, a new hospital, and a woman's quarter. 
as well as a new home for the warden. A stone wall surrounded an exercise yard, gardens, and an orchard where prisoners would work. Now this wall is what a lot of people remember when they think of the prison today. In the late 1870s and throughout the 1880s, the federal government began prosecuting hundreds of men who were members of the LDS Church for participating in a doctrine of plural marriage. More add-ons to the territorial prison were expanded, with new buildings constructed in 1888 and 1891 to house polygamists convicted of unlawful cohabitation under the Edmonds Act. Many LDS members were convicted at the time. In 1890, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ended the practice of plural marriage, and that would end the prosecution of polygamous saints. Utah became a state in 1896, and so the buildings and surrounding land were given to the newly created state of Utah and were designated as the Utah State Prison. The office of the state prison were to consist of a warden, a deputy warden, one clerk, one physician, a matron, and as many keepers and guards as seemed fit. Now, fun fact is that Dr. George Allen, who was the creator of Allen Park, would have been a physician for the prison under the same structure during the 1920s. On a more morbid note, beginning in the 1900s, executions would began to be held at the prison. Crazy enough, they used to sell tickets to publicly view the executions by firing squad. With the continued growth of Salt Lake City, the local residents eventually wanted the prison population relocated away from the neighborhood of Sugar House. This in addition to having a growing prison population that would cause the prison to become severely overcrowded. Through the years, the residents lived so close that there are accounts of children playing near the prison and being asked by prisoners to fetch them things from the store with what little they had. Other stories accounted prisoners whistling at women passing by. In 1938, three new locations were proposed. One was near Salt Lake City Airport, which funny enough is where the newest prison in Utah is currently located. But the successor of our Sugar House prison would be the one at the point of the mountain in Draper. During the construction of the new prison, trusted prisoners would be brought to help build the new prison. The buildings that the prisoners were staying at were incomplete. The construction was also taking place during the World War. This would cause a severe understaffing of guards to watch these prisoners. This also slowed the work due to the materials taking longer to arrive. I did think it was funny that they used the words trusted prisoners because there were a lot of newspapers that talked about trusted prisoners just walking off. Yeah, that's right, many of these trusted prisoners were escaping. Some were so confident that they even told everyone that they were leaving. In 1949, newly elected Governor J. Bracken Lee began pushing for resolution of the prison issue, calling it the most important building issue in the state. It had been pointed out that without adequate fencing, the prisoners were going to continue to simply just walk away. Because the progress was taking so long, the old prison's overcrowding problem would go from bad to worse. Inmates were sleeping in corridors, basements, and previously unused women's dormitories in three cell blocks. The ancient buildings at Sugar House were labeled as fire traps by the state fire marshal. Ideas were constantly being brought forward to help reduce the time and cost at the new prison. A change from a 20-foot concrete wall to double 12-foot high fences spaced 20 feet apart was reportedly as saving $400,000. Finally, in March 1951, the new prison was ready for all the prisoners. Focus after the prison had been shifted to what would be done with the old site that the prison was on. Proposals to repurpose the land included an amusement park, a campground, a golf course, and a shopping center. 
The former site eventually would be jointly owned by Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County, while 30 acres were set aside as the future campus of Highland High School. Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County established the Sugar House Park Authority to administer the 120 acres that comprised of the former prison site. Demolition of the prison began, however, it moved incredibly slow. They were taking sticks of dynamite and the sticks of dynamite had little effect on the wall, so it actually had to be removed brick by brick. This would have been very frustrating, but the silver lining is at least we know that the walls were strong. Next time you stand at Sugar House Park or at Highland High School, you can look around and almost picture the walls of the prison, the farms and the lands that once held hundreds of prisoners. There is nothing left of the prison except for a plaque with some bricks of the prison that is found in Sugar House Park. The land has been transformed, hopefully just like the people who were contained inside the walls there. It is a place that has truly become reclaimed.